Uh, today's, or where you're at, we're going to talk about the civil rights in the 21st century. Uh, we have a, a wonderful group of panelists, and we're going to start out by each of them talking, um, talking uh, about five minutes each about uh, civil rights in the 21st century. But I have a, I have a nice little uh, civil rights story that I thought I'd tell you all first. So uh, in 1968, I was in the uh, third grade. I know, black don't crack, that's the way it is. <laughs> but believe it or not, 1968, I was in third grade. And I remember uh, the principal came to my class, called my, t my uh, third grade teacher out into the hall. My third grade teacher leaves the hall. And you know, she was, she was not a very nice person. I remember her using the ruler thing, corporal punishment wasn't against the law. And I do remember getting hit in my hand with that whole ruler thing. And I don't know what I could have possibly done so bad that somebody would hit me in the hand with a ruler. But anyway, she did. And she came back in the class. And when she came back, I was almost frightened like every other little kid in the third grade because she had turned totally white. I mean, you know, to that point, I've never seen anybody drained of the blood in their face. And she slowly raised her head and she said, OK. Uh, the school is on fire, there are angry people in the streets, and they're beating up teachers. I want you all to stand up, go into the hall, and run home as fast as you can. Don't look back. And of course, all we could do is try to find out where the smoke was. And our school was on fire. And not only was our school on fire, it was kind of, you know, an exhilarating moment, but it was also a very fearful moment because a mob ran into our class and, and grabbed our teacher, and we didn't know what to do. So we just all ran because we were all kids, and they were burning down the school, which uh, for us was our place, but it symbolized part of what they were so angry about at that moment because uh, people had, or a person had decided to kill Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Where was that at? Oakland, California. It was Oakland, California. And in my high school, interestingly, was two blocks away from the Panther office, which you know at that time was a couple of years old. So it wasn't a, a big organization as it had become, but it was one definitely with a certain objective and how they responded to that particular act was quite distinct. So uh, the civil rights movement today is very different uh, than it was at those times. And uh, you know we've had a few riots over the last 15 or so years, but uh, those have occurred in very different ways and different manners and haven't uh, been provoked in, in the same kind of ways. And I guess what we're going to talk about now is uh, not necessarily just that past, but uh, if, if I go from our pre-conversation, we're going to talk about how that past is leading us to the future, how, one, it got us to where we are, and uh, I'm not sure we all agree where we are, and I'm not even sure we all agree where we're going, but at least that makes fruit and food for a nice conversation. Uh, we're going to go from each person. You'll find the bios in the, in the, uh, in the little booklet that you have, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, and I'm going to allow my uh, colleagues to just jump right into it, and we're going to go uh, from just, we're going to start with Dave, and then we're going to move our way over. All right? So you, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Sidhu. I'm a 2000 graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. I uh, studied philosophy. It's a little weird being back here. I have uh, some feelings of being in class again, and I feel like I'm going to be called on, or one of the professors is going <laughs> to grill me on some reading you I did into. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say how proud I am of uh, of what's taking place here. Um, I'm very happy to be with these panelists, and I'm also very happy to be here with you. Um, and coming here, you're not only uh, looking at Penn again and seeing what's different, but you're also expressing a commitment to. Uh, diversity and inclusiveness here and uh, hopefully within 5, 10, 15 years you can tell other people that I was at the first inaugural uh, Penn Spectrum Conference 
uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll have grown significantly since then. So I really want to uh, express my, my pleasure at, at being here with all of you today. So um, we're here talking about civil rights in the 21st century. Uh, I'm a member of the Sikh faith, uh, S-I-K-H, and members of that faith uh, have encountered significant uh, problems after 9-11. Um, some of you who are very educated, intelligent, may not even know who Sikhs are. And in the aftermath of 9-11, Sikhs have been confused with Muslims. Uh, and it's been a, a significant struggle for my community to explain uh, who they are and to uh, make a case that initiatives that are there to protect Muslims should also protect Sikhs themselves. Um, the professor mentioned um, the historical link between civil rights in the past and now. And what I'm finding is that even though 9-11 is new, and, and some members of the government will talk about how 9-11 has brought about this new paradigm and it's just unprecedented, but really in the civil rights community, what we're doing is looking back and seeing how successes of the, uh, of the, the previous uh, era and generation can be applied now. And uh, one of the things I'm most interested in is seeing how organizationally, uh, as well as um, at the grassroots level, how do we establish those bonds? And how do we make the case that my civil rights issue should be important to you? Uh, and even though resources are limited, and even though people want to spend time only on their group's issue, to argue that there needs to be this uh, solidarity. And it's only through that solidarity that I think true uh, civil rights uh, equality is going to be achieved. I'm driven actually by, by three overarching principles. One is that, as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think we need to be very mindful of that. So even if something affects maybe just a Muslim or, or a Latino member or member of the gay uh, community, that it's something that a Sikh should now stand up for, uh, even though he may have limited resources. Two is that no group is going to pick itself up by its own bootstraps. That's a, a famous quote by Thurgood Marshall. Um, and that's something I think the Sikh community needs to be mindful of as well. Uh, and every community who struggles for civil rights needs to be mindful of. The third is uh, why, uh, why do I care? Uh, why am I even here? Uh, yes, it is about making sure that my father can leave the house and not be called bin Laden or terrorist. I'll give you a quick story. When I was uh, at Disney World with my family, um, I had been studying these issues for, for some time, but never directly encountered any problem. Uh, when I went to Disney World with my family, uh, a group of kids started pointing at my father and, and saying, well, we found bin Laden. Uh, so this is in the happiest place on earth. And uh, what, what, what do you do in that situation? Oh, you know, do you wait for the, the parents and remonstrate with them and give them a lecture? Um, I carried on, uh, and I had a significant feeling of loss, of helplessness. Um, so, um, you know, the reason why I'm here is not just so that doesn't happen, but it's because my, my vision of America is, is really tainted. It's, it's not where it should be. Um, there's a, a, a prominent lawyer, Indian American lawyer, Neil Katyal, who's now acting Solicitor General, and he defended uh, Salim Hamdan, who's a detainee in Guantanamo, and he was asked after he, after he prevailed, why did you get involved? Why, why did you do this? And he said, my father came here with $8 in his pocket because he believed in something. He believed in a vision of America, and that vision has been jeopardized. It's being challenged. So I'm not here just for this individual, for Salim Hamdan. I'm here be, to preserve what my father believes in, what, what America really means. My father came here with 12 bucks, <laughs> um, but it's the same uh, internal uh, desire and motivation that brings me here today. And I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation. And if anyone would like to talk afterwards, I'd be more than happy to do so. Thanks. Oh, hi. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm uh, Emilio Parrado. I'm a Associate Professor of Sociology here at Penn. Uh, Tukufu is the chair of the department. I'm glad that he doesn't use corporal punishment to <laughs> <laughs> control the faculty. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about, I, I, my, my work main, mainly relates with immigration, and I'm going to talk about the, the rights of immigrants a little bit. And um, 
immigration is a very divisive issue in the U.S. today, and it's actually one of the most contentious issues that you can, if you follow the news, and that there's always some discussion about immigration. Uh, at, the ba at the basic level, immigration is a very simple economic issue. It, has, it relates to the mobility of labor, people moving back and forth from areas with little employment to areas with more employment in the U.S., but it triggers all sorts of reactions that had to do with identity in the U.S., identity of immigrants, issues of, issues of assimilation, uh, to what extent they're incorporating, and, uh, and, and those are the things that you know, connect immigration directly with, with rights. I think that it is fair to say today that we're living through a period of very uh, strong and profound nativism. I think that uh, we have to go back probably to the 1920s to, to, to experience a period of, of xenophobia or fear of immigrants that's comparable to what we're seeing today. And that's an issue that really connects uh, the immigration issue with the civil rights issues and the, and, and the fights of minorities and, the, and, the, and other groups. The, if, you, if you look at what's happening today with immigration, you know, we're seeing these, these are things that are happening and we're not always aware that are happening to immigrants. We're seeing massive deportations. Uh, last year, 400,000 people were actually, you know, physically deported from the U.S. Residents in the U.S. were 400,000, comparable to levels in the 1920s. We're also seeing examples of hate crimes against immigrants. We're, we're also seeing even uh, uh, they being denied basic constitutional rights, trying to uh, attempt to pass laws that, that significantly affect immigrants. And, uh, and this also crosses across different groups. It's, it, it gets very closely associated with Latinos and Mexicans in particular, but immigrants come from many different places. We have African immigrants are facing the same situation. Immigrants from Asia are facing the same situations, but clearly the largest group affected is are Latinos and primarily uh, Mexicans, and there, and there are reasons for that. Um, when you think about immigrants' rights, in many ways it crosses across different kinds of rights. You know, what are, what are the rights that immigrants have, or where, where, where are these rights coming from? At the, at the most general level, the rights of immigrants connect with human rights, and the United Nations recognizes migration as a human right. Not as a fact that you have the right to migrate, but as a, you know, if you migrate, you have the right to be treated fairly, and uh, and and you know, to follow the the receiving country has to follow the law, and you, and you have rights because you're you're a human being, and some of, even some of those rights are sometimes sometimes being denied to immigrants, uh, but it also crosses other kinds of rights. Uh, it also connects with workers' rights. You know, these are these are people that migrate into work, and so what are the rights of workers? What do we recognize? as the right for workers, and, and, and that opens a whole different, different uh, uh, area of rights, but it connects also with religious rights. You know, people, when migrants bring different religions, and so, and so do they have religious freedom? Do we protect them? We, we've seen all the discussion about the mosque in New York and all, all those things that connect uh, indirectly with, with, or directly uh, with, with, immig with, with immigration. The one that's particularly important, I mean, civil rights in many ways, thinking about immigrants and civil rights, kind of has this broader umbrella where all, all these issues enter as part of civil, of civil rights, but at the, at the current stage that we are now, for immigrants, workers' rights are particularly salient, are particularly important. We have uh, uh, an immigration system that denies some basic workers' rights to, to immigrants. Uh, our immigration, this is something that particularly affects low-skilled immigrants. Uh, we have a very good immigration system when it comes to high-skilled immigrants, and we have very good regulations, and we have a very, a very, very efficient way of attracting and retaining high-skilled immigrants. I'm part of that experience. Uh, you, you come to the U.S., you enter into the, I'm the, the university. I'm sorry about that, but you have about <laughs> just two more minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> You enter to the U.S. and you have, and, um, and so for high-skilled migration, we have very good regulations. The problem that we have is that we don't, we have not addressed the issue of how to regulate low-skilled migrants. And this is particularly so when it comes to, to, to Mexicans. 
uh, in many ways, we have implicitly created a sort of a perfect worker because it's, a, it's, a, it's from if you take a cynical view of the whole issue and you think about from a, from a capitalist perspective, it's a perfect worker. It's somebody that's working and is committing a crime just for, for working. So it's somebody that's in a very vulnerable position for working, which is, when, when you think about it, it's very detrimental for the position of the, of the immigrants and it's detrimental for, for other groups. And this is not just something that just affects the employers. You know, this is not just something that employers are, are, are exploiting workers and we keep them like that. This also affects, you know, we all benefit. It's like overall, we all receive services from undocumented, whether we know them or not. We all consume groceries produced by undocumented workers. And, and, and so they, it, it's something that as a society we need to address because we have this portion of the population that's being denied basic rights. And that's something that probably we need to, we need to come to agree on, that we have this portion of the, the, the immigrants are a portion of the U.S. population. And so we need to come up with some way of recognizing them in, the, in this particular status and, and thinking about what kind of rights they deserve, what kind of rights we can give, we can give them, what kind of, it, it's, it's something that's seriously undermining the position of low-skilled workers. We have this group of people that's in a very vulnerable uh, situation. They cannot clearly demand civil rights because they're not members, technically, of the U.S. population. So the immigrants are extremely vulnerable because they, when they demand something, they don't have rights even to demand it. Have you seen it when you have these mobilizations of immigrants and then the common reaction is that they don't have the right to be here. How can they be demanding anything? And so this, this vulnerable position extends uh, uh, across, uh, extends and, and it, it, it undermines the position of all low-skilled workers. This is something the position of immigrants is affecting the position of other Latinos that are legally in the U.S. because they get, you know, dumped into the same group. And this assumption that everybody's undocumented, that, they, that, that nobody has the right to be here, is an, it's an issue that, that's seriously undermining uh, their position. So I would say that you know, immigrant rights are, are a key element of the, of the, of the civil rights in the, in the 21st century. And we need to come to terms with some sort of, of how we're going to deal with this population that, given labor market conditions, is going to keep coming to the U.S. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. Pierre. Well, uh, my name is Pierre Larson, and um, I'd like to stress three things that uh, I hadn't thought of, even though you know, about gays, about gay rights as about gay rights as part of civil rights, that um, I think often get overlooked. The, uh, it, it, some things become part of the wallpaper when you're a minority. You just take it for granted and you get used to it. In the gay community, the one thing that I think we've taken for granted, which it needs to always be up in the forefront, is that we're still the only community uh, that is actually legislated against. That you actually have national, local, state legislation against. Now that's, that's pretty significant. Um, in, in effect, uh, the United States would not be admitted to the common market. <laughs> Think about that. The second thing is that in the gay community, we're everywhere, and uh, so we're, we're part of every minority. And this country, despite uh, Sarah Palin, is, is, <laughs> is a country of minorities. Uh, my, my husband's uh, father had to jump ship in Boston in the 20s, in that period. So I really relate to what you said, Amelia. And, um, and my mother, uh, who also came from Sweden in the 20s, 
was forced to, uh, the only thing she could do, and her, her sisters, was to wash the floors. And she was raped by her employer. And it's still going on today. The, the interesting thing is we are everywhere. Gays are everywhere. We're part of, you know, it's kind of a flat 10% tax. <laughs> <laughs> But we're the only minority that's kicked out of our own families still and kicked out of our own communities. And we have to go on the down low or we have to hide. Now, I wrote a book called Game Money back in oh, 13 years ago. And uh, I did so to help the the gay men I was helping, uh, who were disabled by AIDS. I learned a lot of things by listening to them. And the one thing I, 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 I learned the most was that, remember gay pride? Yeah, all those, you know, all those dykes on bikes and, you know, the, the guys running around tutus. Yeah, we sure do. <laughs> I didn't do that, okay. <laughs> but gay pride was a big thing and often is a big thing in every minority group. And it's a really seductive thing, believe me. And it's really necessary. But it can also be a dead end. We learned that. Because you know how we got finally things moving with employers. When we sat down at our places of work and came out and asked to have gay employee groups, and then we asked to have the gay stereotypes removed from the advertising. Then we asked for equal benefits for our domestic partners. Actually, <laughs> That was our first of four gauntlets when we, fi we finally got married in Connecticut. But I, I just loved it when we got that certificate. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> I really loved it when they, when they finally said to us, you are now domesticated partners. <laughs> but, uh, it was when we pursued a path of stressing our commonalities with our neighbors, with our families, with the people we worked with, with the people that we, we volunteered with. I'm sorry about that. I heard just two more minutes. Yeah, I'm just about yeah. through. <laughs> I'm having too much fun. Yeah, have it in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's when we pursued this path of inclusion, rather than being such exclusive people, that we finally got our breaks when uh, things finally started to look up. So those are, are kind of lessons that I'd like to share. Since we are everywhere and a part of every single minority in this country, I do want to stress that we absolutely believe in working with other minority groups. And we absolutely fail at doing that. And that is a contradiction that I face all the time in my writings. So thanks a lot. Uh, be before I open it up for somebody timing me, <laughs> before, I, before I open it up for, um, for questions, I, I started by just remembering my third grade situation, which is uh, uh, a case where basically uh, a lot of African-American communities were 
were on fire in response to the brutal murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, it seems to me one of the distinguishing features of the 21st century in terms of race relations, at least uh, in terms of perception, maybe, but maybe in terms of reality, I'm, I'm interested in you all's uh, con uh, ideas on this, was the election of uh, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, as Because it, it, for many people around the world, it symbolized a tremendous uh, amount. I have been going all over Africa, as an example, interviewing all these heads of state, and all of them want to spend at least 10 minutes talking about what it means to them that Barack Obama was elected in the United States. And that is, is pretty, it, and I always thought it was very powerful because they're presidents in their own right, uh, but they wanted to talk about how big an impact Barack Obama had on them, sometimes not materially in their country, but symbolically what it changes for hope and what people can do. Do you see similar kinds of things happening with uh, the election of Barack Obama in terms of the various issues that you all are talking about? I'll take the first stab. Um, first, I, I, I mentioned that I'm a graduate of uh, Penn uh, class of 2000, but there was no applause, so I'm just... <laughs> I was uh, not offended, but I was, I was hoping that tradition would carry over. Um, so yeah, the reason why uh, 2000 came to mind again is because I'm very relatively young, and I'm one of the legion of young folks who was just uh, so inspired by Barack Obama's personal story, and also by the vision that he uh, promoted during his campaign. Um, so, uh, you know, the question is, um, you know, how does that relate to civil rights work that I do? Um, I, I think the, the, there's, there's two things that immediately come to mind. One is Barack Obama's uh, ascendance to the presidency indicates to members of the Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Sikh community that if you uh, commit yourself to um, your studies, to public service, and he worked in Chicago doing grassroots work, that you can reach the heights of American public service uh, in your own life. Um, so I think it sends a very powerful message that it's not just some theoretical abstract idea that if you come to America, anything's possible. If you actually do the work, uh, you can become uh, a significant leader uh, either in government or in uh, the corporate world or in yet any other sector or context uh, in American life. Um, the second is that uh, you know, the work that I do is uh, sort of reactive in one sense, that we look to what the government does and say, yes, that's wonderful, thanks for reaching out to us and changing your policies. Um, you know, you're not going to pat down our turbans when we go to the airports. Thanks for listening to us. But it's also uh, can be uh, very negative. Uh, why aren't you extending habeas rights to Muslims in Afghanistan? Um, so even though some in the Muslim, Arab, South Asian Sikh community were very thankful and believed in this transforma uh, transformational vision of Obama, once he got into power, he became, just like any other president, subject to... Uh, criticism or the need to um, uh, develop relationships with. And that, I think that's a wonderful thing about America. He's not exempt from the need to challenge power and uh, to need the need to challenge the state. Um, he's a part of this dance that takes place uh, in any um, presidency, in any administration. Um, and I would think that he's more receptive towards civil, civil rights concerns and civil liberties concerns because of his past, because he was a constitutional law professor, because he was at Harvard where um, he was one of the few um, African Americans there. And, and um, so we're, we're, this is an ongoing uh, situation where we're, we're conducting this uh, back and forth. Um, so Barack Obama being there doesn't mean he's all of a sudden going to institute policies that are favorable to minorities and, and uh, going to all of a sudden adopt different principles than Bush administration did. In fact, there's a law professor here, David Rudofsky, who's coming out with an article saying the exact opposite, that, he, that Obama's extending the Bush policies when it comes to wartime issues. Um, so just because Obama's there doesn't mean you know, things are going to be different. But 
what's great about the United States is that we can engage in this process uh, and we can challenge him to the extent that we feel it's appropriate. So yeah, in short, there's two messages. One, anything's possible if you, if you do your work. And um, two, that you, you, you still have to develop those relationships with the uh, administration and uh, challenge him to the extent that it's appropriate. Yeah, well, uh, well the Latino community was very excited about um, and had high expectations when Obama got elected, especially in terms of immigration reform, because uh, obstacles to immigration reform have been, you know, associated with the Republican Party, and uh, and I think it's fair to say that it has grown increasingly disillusioned with the possibilities of actually something being done. And uh, one of the issues that the I think that is is affecting. The relationship with the, the Latino community, with the, with the Democratic Party, is that first of all, Latinos as a political force are not big. You know, you hear all everything about Latino being, you know, 13 percent of the U.S. population, but 50 percent are foreign-born, and um, so not everybody votes, and uh, city, no, not many of them are non-citizens. They also tend to be young, so they're not necessarily in voting age. And so they only have, as a political force, they're only significant in very in, in local areas. And uh, only recently, they're, they're beginning to see, you follow some of the demographics, they could have more of a stronger presence. So who's defending immigrant rights is, is, is very difficult because nobody has a, a peculiar interest in defending immigrants' rights. And one of the problems that the, the Latinos see, and, uh, and I think it's, is that you don't need necessarily immigration reform. You don't need comprehensive immigration reform to address some of the issues that are affecting immigrants. Uh, deportations are a record high, 400,000. This is during the, the Obama administration. Uh, there's increasingly uh, the, the connection between the police and immigration control is increasingly being promoted by the administration. There is this new program that's secure communities where they're basically forcing local communities to share their information with immigration control and enforcement agents. San Francisco doesn't want to participate, but they're being forced into participating. They have to sue the federal government because they don't want to use police resources to persecute workers. And it's those kind of little things that could make a tremendous difference for immigrants without com comprehensive immigration reform. And it's those little things that are not being done by the administration, and you don't need to go through Congress. You, don't, you know, these, these, are, these are things that just if you start, stop persecuting immigrants, you will make a huge difference in the lives of immigrants, and those are the things that are not being done. So it's a, uh, every once in a while, Latinos are feeling more and more they're being used, you know, when, when elections come, they remember that there's some immigration problem, you know, like right now, they try to pass the DREAM Act. That would be a fantastic thing to get it passed. And, uh, but it's being done not, you know, like some sort of, you know, it's not really part of the agenda. And uh, so that's, that's, that's the problem. Here. Well, I, lo I, looked at, I looked at Obama's election uh, as a triumph of, of coalition building. And he, he, he just would, could not have been elected without the bringing together of a, of a huge number of diverse publics in, in, in this country. And he, he was, they were, the Democratic Party and he were very good at that. But like, as I think is true of any country, coalition building often stops and coal, let's say coalition maintenance stops when, when the election's over. And, and that happened in the last two years. It certainly happened with the gay community, but it also happened with, with the Hispanic community, with immigration, with virtually every community. So what do you do? Well, uh, the, the interesting thing is that now, if, if, oh, I, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. Are we facing, you know, the triumph of the right, or are we facing yet another 
backlash against uh, minorities, against, against immigration, against the fact that this country was formed <laughs> by bringing everyone from outside in. Yeah. But the, the difference between the 1920s, I was very interested when you pointed that out, and today is that now the, the discrimination that we're practicing as a nation is actually hurting our national security. I think it's probably the number one thing that, uh, that we've done as a country that, that is really going to hurt us. Because the world is now one world. Ask any corporate executive who graduated from Wharton. <laughs> I mean, they know, they know it's one world. And in this one world, there are all kinds of colored faces. And I got news for you. The white ones are in the minority. And they're going to be in a minority in this country very soon. And I applaud the day. Because then maybe the United States can join the rest of the world. But I think that's what's happening. Is it's not the Sarah Palin's. The, the so-called right is like anti-everything. But the one thing that they seem to be for, most of all, is uniformity. Uniformity of color, uniformity of position, uniformity of belief. And that's the one thing the world is not today. This is a giant step backwards. And I think if we simply started dealing with it as a national security issue, pointing out the fact that what we're doing in immigration, what we're doing in, in, our, in our minority communities, is undermining us, and not only undermining us in the world, but it's actually inciting us. Mm -hmm. when, when, when the shrub decided to export democracy to the Arabs, which is, I think, exactly what the, the story was, I think he was delusional in that he, he really believed that democracy was the, the form of government, well, I got news for you. There are lots of forms of government all over the world. And democracy is kind of a minority among them. And there are, there are many different shades, all in between. But the, that big mistake that he and his group made is being made by a lot of people in power, a lot of people clutching onto power in this country. And so I think by, by, by telling these people, because the only thing they seem to, to worry about is national security, that it's a national security issue, might be a way of a back door for getting to them, them to see this, this fundamental error. Um, okay, I just want to take a moment to as, take the proud prerogative of me being the uh, moderator to say something and then I'll open it up for questions. It seems to me that posing the issue as a security issue, looking at it simply in these ways is a, is a, is a tremendous mistake. And I do agree that's what people listen to, but having the war on drugs, it did not have the anticipated consequences. The number of uh, African-American and Latinos who are now in jail as a consequence of responding to drugs in that way uh, was fundamentally problematic. And I think that, in, in, in fact, uh, if we want issues addressed, we have to address them for what they are and seek remedies which don't use a model which, once you have a war on something, uh, you're going to have casualties. And those casualties right now, we're still paying for in terms of the numbers of these folks who are going to jail and the damage that does on communities once they cycle in and out of jail and just the sheer impact that that has had in the United States. Uh, 
Seems to me, too, that I, I just wanted to say this one thing, that definitely Obama has been good about some things, uh, but uh, he has not been a panacea to all of the problems that exist, and definitely not to all of the problems that have uh, existed prior to him taking office, and some of them that have come up while he's been in office, because no president uh, ever is. Uh, and that's not to let him off, but to say that basically he has done some things, and there's a long laundry list of what he has done, um, but he should be called to carpet, as, as Dave says, for all the things that he hasn't done and where we find him short. So do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania General Assembly, our legislature, is currently running two bills. Uh, one is essentially a need verified bill, which is an employment in verification of the way of finding uh, undocumented workers who are uh, paying taxes, paying Social Security, which they never get, uh, and been controversial around the country. And, uh, people thought because of the Democratic majority in one of our houses, and because of the influence of even the Philadelphia delegation, largely Democratic, well represented by people of color, that that would never survive. It's clearly surviving and flying through the legislature. Uh, a second bill, which is essentially an Arizona type bill, got introduced, and everybody you know, who watches politics and, and legislation said that's never going anywhere. Got assigned to a committee of a very liberal Philadelphia Democrat. She's going to hold it in committee forever. It's not going to go anywhere. The, the only other way of getting it out is getting the whole House to vote to recall it. Never put Democrats in charge. That will never happen. Last week, there were enough votes to recall that Arizona type bill and get it out of committee and force, especially the Democrats from more conservative parts of the state, to vote on it. And they were afraid that it was going to fly. And it was basically the, the power of one, you know, a couple African American elect, uh, legislators in the state that got it into a committee where they could control it and die. And that's why the Arizona bill didn't fly. It would have been, would have been vetoed by a current governor. But, but a, a very sobering moment. Uh, uh, what was also more very sobering about that was the way some coalitions failed for it or it demonstrated that they really didn't exist. The labor was a big part. Not, not the farm workers were obviously you know, advocating for immigrants or the chamber, but the, you know, the traditional coalition of labor, to the extent that that's reality and not myth, was working the other way. Labor was pushing the anti-immigrant bills. And at various points, in closed caucuses, some of, the, some of the identity of the coalitions fell apart. So, so that sort of a preface to my question, which is, is coalition, is coalition politics still, you know, is, it, is, it that we, is it that it's no longer a good model for just the failure to establish coalitions? I disagree that the Obama campaign was about coalition politics, I think what he did at a level superior to anything that's been seen in, in, a, in politics before was a, sort of a networking at, the very, at, at individual levels because the group politics wouldn't, I think, have led to the Obama election. So is it that we sort of need, in the 21st century civil rights, we need to, you know, the, the, the Facebook politics uh, for, uh, uh, or do we need to go back and kick ourselves in the butt and say we need to get our own group politics together and, and reestablish the value of, of, of coalition building, uh, which seems to be sort of, at least from my limited perspective, failing all over the world. Okay. Let me just get two, can we hold that question? I just want to get two questions out and then have you all respond. So you all got that question there? Uh, way in the back in the green uh, sweater there. Um, I just want to uh, 
Can you talk louder, please? No, sure. I'm sorry. I want to respond to something that um, Pierre brought up, which is the idea of inclusion. You have to speak louder. I don't think we have mic. Um, the idea of inclusion and commonality, and I certainly agree with that 99% um, of the way, but I do question the idea of pursuing commonality at the um, at the expense of our our culture uh, and our cultural uniqueness uh, for everyone in this room. You mentioned uh, dikes on bikes. I have friends that had bikes, would be dikes on bikes. Um, and I think that there is a culture in the gay community that is special to our community. And I worry about sacrificing that or turning our back on that in the interest of quote unquote inclusion. I mean, I don't know that it's something we should fight for anyway. Okay. Dave, you want to start? Sure. Um, first, uh, I just wanted to add a little bit to the, the question about national security uh, and civil rights, uh, the connection here. Um, there's a, a professor of political science, Joseph Nye, uh, out of Harvard, who has this concept called soft power. What soft power means, uh, it, it's a contrast to hard power. Hard power means uh, military might and uh, economic coercion, more strong hand, which America's great at. Um, and then there's what's called soft power, which is attraction to values. It's more of the battle for hearts and minds. So um, a commitment to civil rights is, I, th I think, a, a form of that power. Now, if, if we have um, the Muslim world or moderate Muslims abroad looking at us and saying, okay, yeah, people are fighting, that's one thing, but what do I really think about America? And if there's a, an issue like the Ground Zero Mosque and you have individuals protesting the ability of Muslims to establish a mosque, um, either in lower Manhattan or in Tennessee or, or anywhere, some may doubt the credibility of what America truly believes in and stands for. So I, I think there's a definite uh, a link between the two, one in which the, the government hasn't paid too much attention to. Um, second, even if that's the case, even if there's a connection between national security and, and, and civil rights, uh, some don't even care. Um, now, so, some may say, well, is it right or wrong? But some, some don't even want to have that conversation. We had General Petraeus say, look, if you burn these uh, uh, Qurans in Florida, you're going to create, you're going to incite, as Pear used the word, others in the Muslim world to, to dislike us and to maybe pick up arms against us. Did that cause the, uh, the pastor to stop his campaign? No, it didn't. He continued to think about it. So, um, you know, there's, there's the issue of whether that uh, it's even a... Uh, uh, an effective means by which um, civil rights can can change. Some don't even care about the national security question. Um, now, the, the third point with respect to national security is, is how it's framed in the media. Uh, we haven't talked about the media and civil rights, and I think the media has a tremendous amount, uh, a tremendous role in, in the American society. Um, there's a mention of Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin's everywhere. Um, um, and, and the conversations that are taking place on, on TV are these binary, uh, fights between individuals. Um, uh, so I, I think the media needs to do a, a much more enhanced and improved job in terms of um, letting the American people know what's really at stake when we talk about individual civil rights issues. Um, now the question by the gentleman right here was, um, is there an either, uh, is it about Facebook politics and sort of the grassroots level, if I understand it correctly, and coalition building? Um, I'm not a politician, I'm not a political scientist, I'm too idealistic and young to, to want to be involved in that arena. What I would just say, uh, that, that's, that's the problem. Uh, what I would just say, my, my own two cents for what it's worth is that it's not an either or proposition, that I am someone who, who worked on a campaign in the, in the past where I was on the Asian American uh, you know, a group for, for this candidate. So that's coalition building in one sense. And now on, on the other, we have, uh, I'm on Facebook all the time. You know, if it was appropriate, I would have been Facebook when we're having this conversation. You know? But it, I, I don't think it's an either or a proposition. I, th I think candidates do have to do both. Uh, the, whether it's um, effective is, is not for me to answer, but I think it's uh, both have a, a place in American politics. Um, now, let me tell you a story about the E-Verify system. I was. I, I recently moved from Duke to, to Penn, and uh, when I had to come here, they, for some reason I, I couldn't find my social security card. So I went to get a new social security card. So when I apply, and uh, I'm a U.S. citizen, so I, you know, I brought my passport and everything. I'm still an immigrant, and when I 
get, get connected with these organizations, I still, you know, I still get a little scared. But, and so I brought all my documents, and, uh, and the guy said to me, like, so what do you do? No, I'm a professor at Duke. No, you, 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 you can't. What do you mean? Yeah, here you, it says you're a graduate student, so you, you cannot work in the U.S. I'm a citizen. You have me as a graduate student. I already become a citizen. I became a citizen. I was working at Duke. So he updated my social security information, and that's the system that the E-Verify system wants to push everybody, not just immigrants. And, I, and the, the interesting thing about this whole system that we are, immigration is becoming an issue that's undermining the, the rights of all, even citizens. The civil rights movement fought for this demand that you have to identify yourself, that you prove, you have to prove that you have the right here, that they, it gets, the, those things are being denied even for elections. And immigration is being used to impose restrictions on all citizens. There are some discussion about whether when you go to vote, you have to show ID because they don't want, and the, the argument is that they don't want undocumented workers to vote. We, who, what undocumented worker is gonna try to vote in the US? <laughs> but, <laughs> but we know what happens to minority participating in politics when they ask you to show your ID for every single thing that you do. You have to prove that you have the right to be here. So this is, this is something that affects everybody. And it goes to this thing that we're not being mobilized in recognizing that this is something that's going to affect us all. And the problem with immigration is that I would like to think that most people, if you explain the problem of immigration, would reasonably decide that you have to come up with a way to solve it and to address it. Then we can discuss how we solve it, but we have to address it. But we have a very strong position that they just want to deny. Either we're going to deport them all, they don't have the right to be here, they, I don't want them here, I don't care how, you know, it's a crime that has no restitution. Let's say, okay, let's say that you agree that they crossed the border illegally, they committed a crime. Okay, how much do they have to pay to, uh, to stay here? No, we're not going to reward them, reward them for, 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 for crossing illegally. No, you're not rewarding them. How much do you think they have to pay? Do you want them to do, what is it that they have to do to restitute the crime that they committed. No, no, there's no discussion. We're going to deport them all. So for a, for a large portion, for a sizable portion of the U.S., that's the attitude they're taking. I would, I would like to think that the majority will recognize that this is something that we need to be addressed. The problem is that the majority is not mobilized. The problem is that when they pass this, they propose this legislation, and uh, they get flooded I am assuming that they get flooded with email messages, phone calls from, from groups that are strongly anti-immigrant, and those are highly mobilized. But the vast majority of the population probably you know, don't pay attention to the issue. So immigrants, in that sense, are very vulnerable because they don't have in a particular group that defends, not even employers defend them, that those are the ones that benefit more directly because the undocumented worker is the perfect worker. You know, they don't get paid and they have no right to complain. They can't get organized. Unions are not defending immigrants and it's the most self-defeating attitude that they can possibly take. Because most, the, that, who's working in manufacturing, who's working in agriculture, who's working in lo low-skilled work in jobs are going to be immigrants. Are they taking a self-defeating attitude? What is it that happens whenever we impose these very strong restrictions on work or things like that. The same thing that happens when you impose strong penalties on drug use and stuff like that. You create more criminals. So the only thing that these you know, laws and, and things are, are actually doing, they are creating more undocumented workers. The E-Verify system, the only thing that's going to create is that employers are going to employ people off the books. Before, they, they were paying taxes and everything was fine. Now, they're not, who's going to enforce that employer doesn't hire people off the books? I mean, they're assuming that everybody follows the rules and they're going to check it. Some might do it, but the, but the people that hire undocumented workers, they're not going to go through the, and they're still going to hire them. They're going to pay them less. 
So if, if you are in the same, trying to take the same job that an undocumented worker is taking, an undocumented worker is cheaper than a native worker because we created institutional designs that made them cheap. And uh, so, but the, I don't, I don't, the, 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 the thing is that there's no political vision, political will to actually explain to the American public that this is, given the demographics that we have, low fertility, growing economy, if you want your kids to have better jobs than what you have, somebody has to take the jobs at the bottom. And that's where immigrants come in. That's it, but there's no will to explain that. If Major Bloomberg is the only one that I've heard that actually tries to explain this. The cities, this is going to be particularly detrimental for cities. Where are immigrants going? Even today, they're going to the city. New York, full of immigrants. Pop the population of New York would have declined without immigrants. Philadelphia, same story. They are revitalizing the cities that are also the areas where minorities are concentrated. So this is, this is something that politicians need to, need to need to, there's, there needs to be political will to actually, you know, have a, a rational discussion about immigration. We were not to that point. The best example is John McCain, somebody that proposed at some level was a reasonable guy talking about immigration, and so, you know, then, but then when he goes campaigning, you know, you just can't listen to him. And, uh, so, so. so there is, uh, at least I would suggest, one thing is common in, in what you're saying, Emilio, and what Dave is saying, which is this issue of surveillance and uh, how, it's, uh, how it's operating. And, it, and you all should take a note of, uh, there was a real popular song. You all remember uh, Gil Scott Heron? He had a song out about Johannesburg. And the song that he had about Johannesburg was uh, about basically how you had to present your ID. Uh, you know, and so he had one line in that song which basically referred to you know, Johannesburg, let me see your ID, Detroit, let me see your ID, all of these places where this kind of surveillance was going on and where the, uh, the, the penalties for having the wrong ID and being identified as the wrong person was something you could be penalized for. And so part of what the civil rights movement was about was about eliminating that kind of fear. And it's the fear of another person. And often behind that fear may be economic motives, some of it may be political motives, but if you want to see a historical example of where this has been practiced for a very long time, which is why I think you, you have to be cautious about reclaiming it as a security issue because the civil rights nature of it is what makes it both comparable here and in Afghanistan. If it's just a question of don't do this because they're going to look at you badly in Afghanistan, it's a limited approach because the real fundamental issue is that they shouldn't be doing it here, they shouldn't be doing it anywhere because it violates people's basic, excuse me, human rights. And as a human rights issue, it is something which crosses borders, but something which is very relevant uh, right now. I just wanted to interject that, Pear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that <clears throat> word, as a writer, that uh, words are still lightning rods. And one of those uh, that I used, I want to clarify. Uh, national security. Let's remember that I'm still a wart, you know, wart in school. And uh, that means that when I say national security, I mean economic security. <laughs> and when I look at the United States now today, I don't really, <laughs> I'm not using the, the political meaning of national security. I'm talking about our security in the world, which is our economic security, which we can see very clearly is at risk. And, and my point is that if we make the connection between the fact that our increasingly absurd stances on all these issues, immigration, um, legislating against gays, I mean, whatever it is, is undermining our position in the world economically. The world is just, is just 
and our European friends are just laughing at us. And, and it has economic consequences. The, the other phrase that I used, which was uh, coalition building, glad to see everybody latched onto it. Um, actually, I, I'd like to uh, clarify where I stand on that because I think we're stuck that on the political level, coalition building is a fact of life. I mean, it's the way our political system is structured. Look at the UK. I mean, did anybody ever think that the government in the UK would end up being a coalition? But what really uh, is getting things moving these days is issues management. And the fundamental tool of issues management is Facebook, is social marketing. We have a little nature center that we run. And, uh, and we used to you know, have, have brochures, and we used to have little maps, and, and uh, we'd have full page spreads in the local paper and stuff like that. And we've dropped all that. We now push our nature center through our social networking, through Twitter, through Facebook. And, and even our website is like an afterthought. Because in today's world, that's the, that's the reality of issues. I don't know if anybody has looked at their email recently, but it's all about issues. Now, if somebody sends you an email saying, uh, something like, vote for who's he Mutza. Do you really open that email? No, you, that's, that's a surefire th shot for the trash bin. But if somebody is wor working about, you know, the fluorescent bulbs or, you know, whatever the issue is, the issue du jour, we pay attention to that. And I think that is, I think you're right. I think social networking is the way. Now, uh, to answer the the lady in the back, about commonalities. Uh, I think my point there is that I'm not saying pursue commonalities to the exclusion of pride. I'm pointing out that we pursued pride for many decades to the exclusion of commonalities. And they are not mutually exclusive. Um, let, me, let me just... Uh... <coughs> We'll go. No, I had one other hand back here. Well, why don't we go the, the woman in purple and the woman with the necklace there, and then the gentleman here. Thank you. you know, I think Dr. Kalati kind of answered my question. Um, we were talking, Can you stand up? Sure. I'm sorry. We were talking earlier about politics and Barack Obama and his administration and kind of touched on his priorities. I think in that context, we need to be aware of obviously the Tea Party movement and the extreme right and their self-proclaimed uh, conservative movement. When I think about them, um, I think the stereotype is that they're like an out west, uneducated group of people. But when you look at the numbers, they're actually older, well-educated, typically white men. So when you look at it that way, um, I guess my question is, how much of this is about wanting to really be uniform and how much is it about being young, white, educated men in America no longer guarantees what it perhaps used to in the 50s and 60s? And what can we do um, as minorities, as gays, as immigrants to assure people who are Americans, who are here, they do go to school with us, they do live with us, they do work with us, how do we assure them that we are not here to terrorize you and take over your neighborhoods and you know, steal your children and, you know, <laughs> all sorts of things here that I think for us, perhaps we know this is irrational. We're not here to ruin your church. We're not here to ruin your community. We're not here to steal your values. We're not here to pillage, you know, the village. But we, I think it is incumbent upon us to a certain extent to bring in these individuals and kind of what you said, educate them. There is value in what we bring. There is value in, in the changing diversity of the country. And I do think that's something that I'm a Democrat, as a Democratic Party, we have not done well. As a minority um, group of people, we have not done well. And I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, can we take, no, I just want to get those three questions out and then we'll respond to all of them. Yes. Hi, um, I live in Washington, D.C. and some of you may know earlier this year, same-sex marriage became legal in D.C. and uh, our D.C. Council passed legislation. And while that process is happening, 
there was a lot of um, discussion in the media about whether or not the majority of black population in D.C. supports uh, same-sex marriage in D.C. and some polling was done and some people claim that, you know, well, the black residents don't support same-sex marriage in D.C. Well, I'm from D.C., I'm black, and I actually do support it, and I was very happy when it passed. So um, this sort of relates to the, the whole issue about coalition building, and I guess my question is, moving forward, because all these issues, these are all still outstanding issues that haven't been resolved. Is there, do you see opportunities or maybe generational differences in trying to move towards a more coalition building? Because I think, you know, there are issues where, for instance, with immigration, you know, I'm a native born American, but I feel very strongly about the issues that you talked about. And there might be opportunities for, to bring in people who are allies who aren't part of that direct community to support those efforts. And so, but I think with maybe some of the younger residents within the United States, you don't see as much of those, as much of the diverse, uh, divisive dynamics as perhaps you may see in, you know, maybe with, with older generations. So I wonder if, if you all see any opportunities in terms of moving for, more towards a coalition building that will benefit lots of groups of people. Yes, sir. Uh, when the issue came out about the, uh, Could you stand up and talk a little bit When the issue came out about the mosque being built in uh, New York City, what it made me do is think about my background and what I studied. There are two documents which I did not mention, should be mentioned, our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, but they guarantee us certain rights. We seem to forget that. We, we just look at that. I think people are, some people are just forgetting about that they exist, but they exist with rights. Okay. Uh, the issue of immigration directly connects with concerns about race, ethnicity, and the racial and ethnic composition of the U.S. And uh, I'm a demographer, and it always upsets me when I hear the dem demographic projections by race and ethnicity, because they're completely flawed as a demographer, but more, more importantly, because I think you can read them two different ways. You know, you can stress how interesting the U.S. is diverse, it's growing diversity, and you can have a positive attitude towards it. But overall, I think that basically scare, you know, white older people, and uh, which is sort of interesting because the, the projections are done for 2050, and so by 2050, you know, if you don't read them carefully, you might think that whites are going to disappear. <laughs> but most of the people that get scared are not going to live to 2050, so I don't know why they're so concerned. <laughs> Hold I hope ask, for that eternal life drug. That's right. <laughs> Whenever I, I teach a course on Latinos in the U.S., and I ask, I ask them, you know, so what percent is Latino? 25, 30, you know, it's 13. Uh, what percent is white? They have no idea. I ask, what percent is foreign born in the U.S.? Hmm, 30, 40 percent, it's 10 percent. And uh, so we have a distorted vision of, of what, what, what's happening in the U.S. and how much of this is actually, yes, yeah, so the, it gets exploited. You know, the reality is that whites are going to be the dominant group for a long time. And uh, with Latinos in particular, it's really tricky how these things are done because 50% of Latino or Latinos say they are white when they answer the census. But when it comes to projections, they don't get counted as white for some reason. And uh, so, there, but it's this fear the U.S. has for the longest time associated the dominance of the U.S. of the greatness of the U.S. to a white culture or a white. And, and ideas of racial superiority are very powerful, and you see them in the immigration discussion very powerfully. And uh, so definitely, with the, the, as, as what we, we still have to undermine those ideas of racial superiority or that the, whatever the U.S. is because of a particular race or stuff like that. And the reality is that 
there you face some obstacles about how much you can convince people that that's not what happened. And at some point, they might not like it, but you have to change the thing. Sometimes I feel like uh, we're going to need like a civil rights movement for immigrants because it's like you, they, whatever, whenever you try to be rational, you try to explain these things, then you get this very nativist reaction and that blocks any potential for any reasonable discussion of the whole thing. So at some point, you have to say, you know, immigrants have to say, we, you know, we are a portion of the U.S. population, whether you like it or not, and, and this is what we're demanding, you have to follow this. The problem with immigrants, and it, it's not new, you know, and it's not just immigrants, when they try to do that, those ba very basic mobilizations about, you know, presenting and, 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 you know, just marching in L.A. or something, and they all got wrapped in the American flag to show that they were not a threat to the U.S. and stuff like that, it just backfired. But this is not new. The civil rights movement was also the first reaction. It backfires. You're not going to tell me what you, what rights you have or stuff like that, and it tends to backfire. If you add to that that the that large portion is undocumented, they're very vulnerable. Every time they approach something, any institution, they, they fear deportation. Every time they cross a stop sign, they fear deportation. They're, they're in a very vulnerable position. So we really need political leadership, it, and it's undermining, it's undermining other groups. It's undermining legal resident Latinos. We've seen in, 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 in Arizona, the law that I trust to, to, to pass, and it's being disputed, and anybody can be stopped if the police suspects this, and who knows, you know, what, what are the limits? There were no limits. To me, what was interesting about that law is that Joe Arpaio, the sheriff of Arizona, said, I don't know why they're, why they're so complaining about it. I've been doing it for, for years. <laughs> so it's already going on. And uh, so, so do, it, it's, it's uh, and, uh, and a lot has to do with this, with fears in the white population and older white population. And uh, I would like to think that there, when you look at statistics about this, there's strong age differences the older whites uh, tend to be more uh, scared about the whole thing than younger whites, which, which again, economically doesn't make sense because if you think about the problems we're gonna have with social security and supporting older people, unless they do something about the labor force and the workforce in the US, you know, the older, you know, you, you could make an economic argument that they're also undermining their own interest, economic interest. But clearly, how you, uh, you can, you, you know, you can convince, you can try to convince them and convince them a little, but you need political will and political leadership to say that's bad as an economic policy. And, uh, and, okay. and you know, there's no evidence that they're not assimilating. They're not, they're no, if you think about assimilation about making socioeconomic mobility. They go to school, they make socioeconomic mobility. They, they, there's no obvious evidence they're bad for the economy. The immigration increase in the US with record low unemployments, the big picture, all groups are, are, are moving up. There's no obvious evidence of negative economic impact. They have had, and that still, you know, all those things get used and, uh, and um, it's really not an economic argument, it's more of a, of a race and ethnicity argument. Um, I, you know, we're over 20 minutes. I'm not quite sure how, how much more time do we have. I know, that's, we were supposed to end 20 minutes ago. Does anybody know how much more time we have? We're over? We have zero more time? Well, they told us to go over. That, and, and they gave the guy in there the green shirt at the time, and he's looking at me like, I don't know, don't point me out, man. Just keep on going. Okay. So do we want to keep going, or are we... Okay, so we want to keep going. Uh, I, I just want to uh, make two brief comments. Um, one is with respect to the gentleman's comment regarding the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Um, I, I think the, the conversation that takes place in the United States and uh, people's understanding of uh, their own country would be significantly enhanced if they actually read those documents. Uh, this would be an awesome point for me to pull out the Constitution and say, oh, I keep a copy with me all the time. Fortunately, I don't, but um, the, uh, 
That said, uh, having been to law school, I, I will say this, that despite the uh, importance and uh, governing weight of the Constitution, there's a, a comment that, that is frequently made in law school that every word is the basis for a legal dispute. So when we say uh, equal protection of the laws or Congress, Congress shall establish no law abridging X right or Y right, what does that truly mean? Um, and, and those um, conversations regarding the meaning of the Constitution are, are taking place all the time and they're gonna be ongoing. Um, and, and it's the judges who ultimately decide what the, what the Constitution means. What I would encourage everyone to do here is to actually read it for themselves and determine on your own basis, what does this, uh, what does this provision mean to me? What does this substantive guarantee mean to me? Uh, what truly is my country about? What I also encourage people to do is read the Declaration of Independence. There's a laundry list of grievances that Jefferson wrote against the King of England. Uh, how many of those apply to Bush? How many of those apply to Obama uh, regarding a, a, a very strong uh, executive branch? You'd be surprised. Uh, I'd hate to draw that comparison that we live in that sort of society, but um, you can sense the, the difference between a, a powerful government and, and that of uh, a vulnerable uh, uh, member of the uh, political community here. The other recommendation I'd make is, uh, how many people have watched The Wire? All right, that, that's f phenomenal. Um, watch it again. Uh, and and those, those who haven't, um, watch, uh, watch The Wire. The reason why I mention that is because we've talked about vulnerable communities. We've talked about people at the very low level who are the ones in prison. And those who are in prison uh, have no out, they have no outlet um, there's a very poignant uh, scene in The Wire in which there's a young individual who, who asks, a, uh, we're talking about generation, asks an older African-American gentleman, uh, how do I get out? And, and the response from the older gentleman is, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't even know the way. Um, so The Wire is great not only because it talks about vulnerable communities, the pawn, <clears throat> but it also talks about where the, the police really have their what, what they're truly invested in. They may not be invested in, in the Constitution, they may be invested in figures. How many arrests did I make? How many people did I put away? Um, it also talks about the media. What do, what do they really report? <clears throat> and and it's, it's startling. Uh, it, really, it's a work of fiction, but it's truly a documentary on uh, American society writ large. So I'd encourage all, uh, I'm a, a big Facebook and TV guy, so I'm glad I got that out today. <laughs> I'd like to uh, just make an even shorter comment because when you mentioned racial superiority, a lot of things suddenly fell into place for me because I'm a great uh, fan of history. And I happen to have read a great deal about the origins uh, that ultimately flowered in Nazi Germany. But what's not known so well is that the best minds of this country and the UK and many in Europe, not so long ago, less than a century, uh, actually not only believed in racial superiority, but attempted in many absurd ways, but very ways that had long lasting impact on the world to demonstrate racial superiority. And what happened in Nazi Germany was almost a caricature of that with the killing of Jews, gays, gypsies, anyone who's different. And I, I would say that the, the, the belief and the theory and the practice of racial superiority is very much alive and well and kicking in this country. And that may be the thing that ties us all together. Because especially with the older generations, because that's how it was back then. And uh, it may be as much the, the older people in power seeking to believe in this as a way of justifying their power as much as it is about white superiority or anything like that. It's, it's I think, a very 
strong key to the puzzle. On that inspiring note, uh, I want to thank all of you for taking time and coming to listen to this panel on civil rights in the 21st century. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a job well done. <laughs>